Hi, I'm Sarah Grafman. I'm here from Harvard X. I'm Sandra Rashi. I'm here from the Harvard Tate Chan School of Public Health. Thank and you. we have some guests who yes. they would like to introduce themselves. We're just microphones for recording. Yeah, we're just as loud without them, obviously. But. Uh, Randy King, I'm a professor of cell biology at the medical school and do a lot of teaching in the first year curriculum over there. Yeah, I'm Peter Boy. I teach Chinese history in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations and Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And thank you both for agreeing to participate in this today. And thank you all for coming today. So as you know, we are here to talk about failure and success. Uh, we're a little, I'm a little, I'm glad we're recording this for posterity's sake, but also I'm aware that talking about failure can be an uncomfortable thing. So please know that what's talked about in here we're not going to go off into the hallways and talk about every oh, Can you believe he did that? Or it's going to stay in this room. Um, so we wanted to start just by acknowledging mostly we talk about we talk about failure in an educational context. We usually talk about student failure. Um, and what does failure mean when you think about the students that some of you teach? Uh, feel free to just shout out or raise your hands. Um, when your students when, when a student is failing, what do you do? Average students don't fail. <laughs> okay then. Average grade is an average grade is an A minus. They can't fail. Has has any? I remember I did see some hands this morning when when asked people give. I think it was D's. Um, has anyone here encountered a student that is possibly failing, approaching failure? Folks, just want to please share. Well, I teach Spanish language classes and do advanced level, and I think that the closest to failure is when you see a student stop attending class. And as we teach all in section, we're acutely aware of our numbers. So there's, there's failure when they just stop showing up and stop even trying. Um, what about failure? Well, that's not necessarily the same thing. Hmm. <laughs> Tell me more, please. Sometimes there are extenuating circumstances, personal circumstances that, that have nothing to do with the student's motivation. Uh, any other tales of, yes? So we have, at the medical school, we have students um, every year who fail in an objective, structured clinical exam of their clinical skills. And um, then you know, have to design some sort of remediation if they actually haven't been able to demonstrate that they've learned core things that every graduating med student is supposed to know. And that's every year we have a handful of those. Um, yeah, certain cultures or in certain certain sort of educational cultures, there are more opportunities where you're going to fail. Um, others that life circumstances might take you out of it. Sometimes failure sort of means that you're you're challenge and you're trying and you're just not quite getting there. Um, what is that, you know, do you think of it, to me that's what I think about, I think about failing successfully when someone, when a student is trying to do something they haven't done before and they don't quite know the steps to do it. Um, does anyone have any examples of that? Whether it's in a current class or in the past or maybe even your own experience as a student? Well, um, like, Xi Jiaming, Central Administration, um, and I do a lot of um, training for uh, staff in pulmonary affairs development. But I also um, am a teaching assistant at the Extension School and in the um, strategic management program. And we have students who can come from a variety of different backgrounds, um, many of whom haven't been in school in a long time, um, many of whom have incredibly successful careers but are now coming back for a degree. And um, well, I have had students who um, you know, are very successful in one area are now coming to the management program because you know, they've achieved a degree of success um, in a more functional area, they want to become managers, and they don't, many times they don't have the finance background or the finance skills. So they take this class <coughs> of strategic management, and they, they just have sort of the prerequisites that they took many years ago, but they're really not up to speed on those skills. And they're very committed and dedicated, and they do struggle. And they, it's exactly as you described, they are motivated, they are invested, um, but they just don't, you know, it's not, it's something out of their comfort zone. And so they have to put in a lot of effort as to why to help them. Thank you for that story. Um, yes, please. Well, I'm going to out myself as a student. Um, I recently took an extension school class where I got 
great grades or like an A plus average for the class, when I tried to apply those skills outside of the class, just not, could not, like I knew how to answer all the questions, I could not apply it outside of class. And that was, you know, probably for a lot of reasons, but it's one other kind of failing where you look successful, but in the end, and thank you, that's actually a great transition because while I think as folks who work as educators, you, you sort of sometimes do encounter students who are struggling and who are, not, who are potentially failing, but actually our focus today is gonna to be a lot more on how we take risks and the opportunities for failure and success that come with that. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Sajel who's gonna give everyone a chance to fail. So in light of failure, I'm gonna tell you guys about my personal failure a few years ago. Um, my freshman year of college, my roommates decided that A's and F's go on the bridge. The first and only F was mine, and it stayed up there for a very long time. Um, but again, it was this environment where we got to fail, and they were excited to support me in my failure. So I still remember it was the college and evolution of bio class. <laughs> but so now I'm hoping that you guys fail with me. I'm asking for five to six volunteers. It is going to require kneeling. You can join us at the back of the room. That would be great. If you've done a helium state exercise, please do not volunteer. So question for those of you who decided to do this. Why were you willing to take the risk? To help you out to a certain extent. It's uncomfortable to be in front of people and to be waiting, waiting, waiting. And I learned from my colleague, you don't have to tell your right from your left, which I fail at. I do want to do that. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else here that agrees to do this? For those of you who didn't want to take the risk, why didn't you want to take the risk? Kneeling. Kneeling. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I had to tell you how to talk. It does require me. So, first thing, willing to take a risk. This is an environment where at least five of you felt comfortable taking the risk. For those of you that did it and for those of you that were watching, what do you think would have helped them not fail? More instruction. More instruction. Going slowly. Going slowly. Practice. Practice. Communicating amongst themselves. Communicating. Less constraints. Sorry? Less constraints. Less constraints. Preparation. Preparation. And I know there are some people who had done this exercise, because when I was like, if you've done it before, you can't, you can't be a volunteer. What if they had been able to tell you some tips on what to do and what to expect? So it's going to be our second takeaway for today is support and where to get it. And then finally, those of you who that who did do it, what did you learn right away? Or even if you just saw them? More instruction helpful. More instruction helpful. What did the stick do that you weren't expecting? Sorry, you said it? It went faster. It went, yeah. faster. It went yeah. way faster than you would think it would go. Yeah. So now knowing that, do you think you could pass it if you were given a couple more tries? Maybe. So, uh, yep. I guess I was interested, why didn't we stop and talk to one another? Like, it was sort of interesting. Yeah. We weren't specifically told that we couldn't talk to one another. We were all out there, we were given a task, it was clearly a joint task, yet we chose to do it as individuals. And if we had just stopped for a minute and actually spoken to one another, I think we probably could have done it successfully. So the, the, the circumstance that was that the, the teacher was there watching you and overlooking so that in some sense your relationship was not to each other, but was to the teacher who was present. And so the focus had, if, if she had walked away and stood up here and turned her back to you, would you have talked to each other? There's still a barrier, right? Like, I mean, I, I have this kind of automatic relationship with you all because you're telling me about the exercise, even if you're not telling me about the exercise. But I, I don't know my colleagues. And just that small fact can prevent some simple sharing. So in a sense, you're doing the same activity but working in a silo. I was just curious. I mean, you said a helium stick, and I wanted to say, why is it called a helium stick? And now I know why. <laughs> Slider than you think it <laughs> But if you had even just paused and basically said, take one minute before you start, that would have created the same kind of uncomfortableness that would have led to conversation. Okay. 
So normally this exercise is used to teach leadership and you eventually as the more you do it, someone is gonna come about and be a leader, start communicating, but I actually like it better as an exercise of failure and how to learn from that. So again, we're gonna go through these three takeaways towards the end as well, but basically take the risk, what's gonna make you take the risk, get support, and what are you learning from it? So with that, we're gonna have you guys turn into your tables. Sure. Um, so please just introduce yourself to everyone at the table. Uh, we're going to do a couple things in our small groups. Uh, introduce yourself to the people at the table and just take a moment to discuss a recent failure you might be willing to share with the group. Uh, you shared your Aiden Fs on the fridge. Just this morning, um, I opened the refrigerator and found that the bread I'm making for Rosh Hashanah tonight had over the dough had overflowed from the bowl I'd put it in last night. So I had to do some quick fixing of that, and we'll see what it's like when I come home later today. Um, so just take a moment, turn and introduce yourselves, and just talk about a recent failure you feel comfortable chatting about. And we'll just take about five minutes for this. Thank you all for sharing your stories. I feel like I heard some pretty, from, from silly to heavy things. So thank you all for, for contributing. Uh, Peter's now going to share with everyone a story about taking risks in his teaching. So this is a story that I, I realized only today that it's, I'm supposed to end with success, but I'm going to talk about abysmal failure. <laughs> um, and I'll take around uh, five to ten minutes to tell you the story. So um, I've been teaching uh, with a colleague uh, a course, uh, sort of a general, general introduction to Chinese history from antiquity, from the Neolithic into the present uh, for around, well, over 25 years, I think. And um, turned out, I had never, I, had, I, didn't, I studied abroad, so I'd never been, had never been in a lecture course. So I had no idea what a lecture course was until I had to do one myself. It turned out I was a very good lecturer. Sur surprised me, surprised everyone. Um, yeah, it really surprised everyone else in my department. But the, um, um, so we went along, and, and uh, at a certain moment, we thought, uh, back in the early 90s, what you could do with a website. And we, we thought about ways in which we could use the web to give students different ways, interactive ways, of engaging with history and seeing things for themselves to make <coughs> points that we wanted to make. And, and the central point we wanted to make was that China was not a unit of analysis, except at a political level that thinking about it as a single culture was mistaken, thinking about all the people as being the same, um, <clears throat> thinking about them all being, as, as a, an email from one of the students in our DCE course said, worker bees and ants who have no individuality. Um, and we tried to break down assumptions like that. So we had, from there, having worked on the website uh, with uh, people who were just, just beginning to do that at Harvard, and then we, DCE said, you know, you could have, uh, you could take an FAS course and you could put it online as well. So that's cool. Let's do that. Because we found that when we had the website, we actually had more students outside of Harvard than from inside of Harvard, and they were more engaged actually with the website than Harvard students were, because Harvard students were very motivated. They said, tell me what the assignment is, and I will go and do exactly that and no more very often. So, um, so we got into the DC course and the. Uh, there are ways of doing that. They'd film us, then we have online sections with the TF. But we, we, in the course of that, we, uh, the, the TFs kept, who were sort of interested in what you could do with digital stuff, kept saying, you know, there's so much more we could do, we should be doing. And being somewhat lazy, my colleague and I didn't do it. But then we heard about this Harvard X thing that was beginning. And we said, I have to be chair of a committee where I was sitting next to a person who had a lot of authority over Harvard X. And I said, you know, if you would let us take our China course, our Chinese history course, <clears throat> and do it as a, um, do it as, as an online course, if you devote the resource to that, we'll devote the time, because this would be a chance actually to realize the promise of this course that we could do so much more digitally online than, and, and really do right by our online students. That was the idea behind it. And so we began, I actually offered a, a new undergraduate course on how do we turn Chinese history into online, into, into a MOOC. Uh, and 
we had no, it was right at the beginning of Harvard X, we had no guidance, no constraints, very little support. And so we just went wild. The course lasts 18 months, right? <laughs> it has 50 modules. It had to be divided into 10 mini courses. But we have 500,000 people registering for it. In fact, um, it's, as far as I can tell from, from the figures I got the other day, we've had more students in that course and more people completing it than any course except CS50. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that, that was a real success. And so we said, well, what we're going to do with this, because we actually want this to have real value at Harvard, and we're to take this course, and we're going to flip the classroom. And, and what that means is we have our lectures have been done, and the Harvard X style is what's called a chunk and test style. You know, people's attention wanders after five or six minutes. You've got to tell a joke. And then um, you do, so you put an assessment. You say, so are you awake still? Um, you push this button, or you multiple choice question, or write, write a sentence or two. And, and so we said, we'll do that with our students. We'll take our lectures, and we'll put them on. They'll just use the edX platform, the Harvard X platform. They'll do that. And then when they come to class, rather than us lecturing for three hours a week with a fourth hour of section, we will use that class time to engage with the students. The students always say they want to be engaged with the professors. We're going to engage with the students really intensively. We'll have discussion. We'll have things to read and discuss. And my colleague uh, had some cool HBS cases to bring in. Um, and he wouldn't have to lecture anymore because he was a boring lecturer. And when he lectured, 50% of the students would disappear within a week. Um, so so we, we went ahead with that. Um, now, we didn't quite understand that, that if, and, but of course, since we wanted students to get the lecture, we required them to do it. And we said, you have to do it before you come to class. And sometimes that meant two or three hours of modules before you came to class. And you had to do the assessments. And we knew, because if you didn't do the assessments, that was 20% of your grade. And failure to do that on time put you in a lot of jeopardy. So we just thought this was great. We were going to spend our time with our students. We said to our TFs, the TFs, you guys can still get paid, but we're not going to have sections because we are teaching the students the section ourselves. The professors are going to be doing all the teaching. So this is a class that had student ratings in the Q guide, like 4.4, things like that, where I had these fantastic ratings in the Q guide for my lecturing. I think I got, at the end of this, a 2.6. I mean, this is, in the Q guide world, this is like really, really dismal going downhill. And the students really disliked the course. And we saw an immediate drop in enrollment of 50%. And my friend, uh, my colleague, who, who, who offered some HBS case, cases and taught them in the HBS style. He did extremely well with it. They, they really, so our relationship reversed. He had for 20 years, he had, he had to get scores behind me. He's a very competitive guy. And, <laughs> and now all of a sudden, he had to look at me, stab me, I was wondering, it's all right, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get over this. Um, and so that, that was just, well, why did it happen? So that's the first question we asked. So what happened here? Because we thought we were doing a good thing. Well, we discovered a couple of things. One is the graduate students were unhappy because they were being deprived of a chance to interact with the students and be teachers themselves. The students were unhappy because they actually appreciate talking to the graduate students more than the professors. That's sort of that's the culture they've been brought up in here at, in, in the college. Um, they were unhappy because they uh, we cold called. We explained the logic behind cold calling. Right? But they were unhappy with that. Um, and then the other thing we found was that they did, of course, they did the assessments, but that meant that they had to keep going back over the lecture, the online lecture, to find a, make sure they got the answer right. And to get the answer right, they had to spend more time, the answers. And all of a sudden, their time on task outside of the class doubled. They were unhappy. They were exceeding them, and they let us know they were unhappy, and students make a choice, and they walked. Right? Um, so that was bad for the study of Chinese history. If you lose, if, you, if part of your goal is to get students to know about Chinese history and to think uh, uh, analytically about it, 
that was that was bad. It was bad for us because it hurt our egos, and um, we could make all sorts of justifications that students do need to do more work, but they can choose not to. It wasn't a required course. We have we know that with some flipped courses that are required courses that they're really successful uh, in terms of learning outcomes. Not that the students like them, but this was an elective. It wasn't a required course. So that's a story of abysmal failure. Um, and we, we, made some, we made some adjustments. Uh, we put back in sections. Um, but still, right, um, I can't say that things have, not, things have not been good. Things have not been good. They would much prefer to have a lecture. And I'm very good at giving lectures, right? So, uh, I was so we you know we're we're not going to put the continue the course in, in the new gen ed program. It doesn't really fit the gen ed standards anyway. Um, it's a terrible way to end your career to think that a course should really <laughs> that uh, that you've just failed. So you want success out of this. How do we measure success? Okay. Well, one way that we didn't talk about enough this morning was that the way. Surely the measure of success has to be what students learn. Not how they, whether they like us. Do students learn more when they go through this? Yes. Do they have to do more work to learn more? Yes. So there's an economy right here where you say, if I do more, do more time, I'll do better, but I don't want to do more time. I have my notion of what a, a, a core curriculum course, a gen ed course should be, how many hours it should cost, and you change the rules on it. So that was... Uh, those students who were in that first course have now all graduated. And this year, all of a sudden, our enrollments doubled. And I said, wow, so how do we account for this? Not only do they double, but the students are active and they're enthusiastic. And we have this full room and, and you know, just constant discussion and cold calling. No one gets upset by that. It's just wonderful. And so we said, you know what it is? It's the students who, who the students have, the, the new generation of students are used to, are more accepting of online stuff, of flipped classrooms, of hybrid blended learning. That's what it is. And the guys who remember what it used to be like in the old days are gone. <laughs> and so students come in and they're having a good time and it's just great. And so I, I said, you know, that, that, that's, that has to be the I have no evidence that's the solution, of course, but it has to be the solution. And then uh, I was talking to the, uh, the staff, the, the staff member who, who runs uh, uh, the undergraduate program, and she said, no, she said, no, I'm afraid not. She said, you know, they're changing the requirements for, uh, for undergraduates from the, the old gen ed to the new gen ed. And so the freshmen and sophomores don't have to do it, but the senior, juniors, and seniors have to fulfill requirements in the old days. That explains your doubling in enrollments. <laughs> but what I will say, what I will say, and this is, I guess this is my nod in the direction of success is that the engagement with the students in that hour, it's an hour and a half section, right? With the students has been really quite extraordinary this year, better than anything we've seen before. But that may just be a function of having a full room, right? So at the moment, I don't know whether it's success or failure yet. Thank you. Thank you so much yep. for sharing that, wasn't it? And at the least from your failure came Successful sharing of the room right here. Yeah, <laughs> Who's on there? Is it that matters to <laughs> um, yes. So I'll actually ask everyone to again go back into your small groups um, and just take a moment again to reflect. I don't know what you talked about in your small groups before, if you talked about sort of more personal little things, but if you could take a moment and thank you again to Peter for really sharing. Reflect on a failure in your professional life, something that didn't go the way you thought it would. And what lesson, you know, did you just say, oh, that didn't work, I'm never trying it again? Or what lessons learned came from that? Uh, and we'll take just about five or so minutes to reflect on, on that. Um, and also thinking about maybe some risks that you haven't yet taken. Risks that didn't work well and risks that you haven't yet taken. So thank you, and just take a moment and gather. So you guys probably all had different stories. We just wanted to see what are some commonalities that came about from your tables. So anyone willing to share out what you guys noticed about your failures? Any kind of aha moments? Any common failures that you tend to have? 
um, common support that you need, any of that sort. This is not really an answer to your question. <laughs> Let's go. Um, but we had a question about, you know, you said you're a really good lecturer. And what does that mean in terms of students learning, if that's a measure of success, but a lecture isn't necessarily the most effective way, but honestly, I like a good lecture. So I'm just curious. It kind of seems complicated, so I'm just curious how okay. you can help. So, so I can, when I'm lecturing, I can tell whether students are understanding right away. And I, I can tell from whether it's getting across, whether my explanation is working or not. Um, and so I want it to work. I want them to understand, right? And so if they're not understanding, I know that's, that's I, I've done a bad job, right? The second thing is that they should be so caught up in the problem or whatever it is you're talking about that they can start to anticipate and sometimes spontaneously question, but what did it? It's coming out of the audience. Um, and and that, that engagement with that story is really important. And then, of course, there's lots of, but I shouldn't take up this time. It's okay. Anybody else? You guys can ask questions. I don't want it. We, I think we were struck by the lack of commonality okay. in, our, in our discussion. We couldn't. Yeah. Other tables also had a similar lack of commonalities. Oh, sorry. Well, I was just um, wondering that if I'm summarizing correctly, uh, a professor might try a novel approach. And this, oh, okay. Um, a, prof a professor might try a novel approach, and students, for whatever reason, maybe fear of failure or just um, fear of novelty, don't react well to the to the uh, faculty's ideas and approach in novel uh, situation. And is that because the, the scenario is, is challenging, or it's not well thought out, or is it just the students that are afraid of novelty? There's that question to you guys. Thoughts on? I, I was thinking that uh, there, <clears throat> one of the things that's coming out is like there are a lot of different ways to fail. <laughs> you know, so I'm trying to think, are there any commonalities or categories? And you know, it did seem like one is mismatches of expectations. Um, and you know, the whole question of whether we could reduce failure and have more success by thinking about expectation setting in a more sophisticated way, whether it's giving instructions for the, your very first exercise or the fact that the expectations of those students or thing it should be like the old curriculum it's the new whatever so i don't know if that's a category that's a great okay i actually have a reflection on like I, I teach language beginners fans so the the failures are related to the grammar and the explanations and all that but i like i always have this idea of how we approach the failure of the students because we fail to explain them properly what they like I see that when I create a, a quiz and say oh no I did it wrong it's my fault but how they that's a moment when you say how do I do this I mean in, in, in grammar it's easy I don't know about other disciplines language is easy to do it's not like I don't know what do you think reflections on that Uh, just a little bit of what you're saying, piggybacking off of what Peter was saying, our small table discussion. I mean, I think the commonality is the success part of the failure, right? And it requires a vulnerability just to take a look at whether it's Q scores or attendance and wonder why, and not just wonder it, but actively go after why, and to keep digging until you can get that answer. Um, you know, whether you're a faculty member, an instructor, or academic professional, you know, opening yourself up for feedback, I think that's tough to do, but people care not to do it. Okay. Thanks. Final comment? All right, I'm going to, oh. So I just want to sort of reiterate the comment uh, with back. My assumption is that when I deal with a student who either thinks that she isn't getting what's going on or seems to me not to be getting, those are two different categories, 
Um, my assumption is it's my problem, not her problem. Uh, and I got to figure out, you know, where the mismatch, um, how it arose. Um, I don't always know exactly what. And the, the, I mean, partly that is actually goes back to your everybody gets A minuses here. You know, the fact of the matter, the students at the law school are pretty talented. And so it probably is the case that if a student isn't getting something I'm trying to do, it's on me, not on the student. So anyway, I, again, figuring out how to respond to that problem is, is the hard part. So I think the magic word for today is mismatch. Um, we're looking at mismatch between expectations amongst faculty and students, mismatch between what I think I'm teaching and what I think my students are comprehending. And then basically to top it all off is how comfortable am I trying to figure out where that mismatch lies and what am I gonna do about it? So with this, I'm now gonna pass it over to Randy who, I always have to look because it's a lot of words and I mix them up. Case-based collaborative learning. Correct. All right. um, so they're doing some novel stuff at the medical school. So I just want him to kind of talk about what's making them take this risk, what support you've had, and kind of what you've learned so far. Uh, so thanks very much. Um, so uh, I've taught at the medical school for about 14 years now. Um, and have been fortunate to work with a, a fantastic group of first-year students. So in the courses that I've taught, I typically uh, teach very early in the curriculum, so they're just trans transitioning to medical school and uh, kind of getting used to uh, drinking from a fire hose, as the analogy goes. Um, and so I think we have an opportunity to, to really understand um, how students react to this sort of change in their learning. As undergraduates, um, you know, students have the luxury of time. In medical school, it goes at a very fast pace. And so one of the challenges we face is really thinking about how do we keep students engaged sort of day in and day out with a curriculum that is a lot of material and a lot of content. And I think that's, that's one of the things that drove uh, the curriculum reform at the medical school and this sort of switch to this so-called uh, case-based collaborative learning, which really was, I think, a nice outgrowth of the work of many people, including Rich Schwartzstein and others at the school, and really thinking about how can we best engage our learners. So the story I wanted to tell is sort of my experience in, in this process, uh, and sort of thinking about how we might do this, how we might take on this approach. Uh, in the old course that I taught, it was a mix of lecture, so they'd have a couple of hours of lecture in the morning, and then a 90-minute uh, small group discussion in groups of eight. And one of the logistic challenges that we face with a class of 160 is recruiting 22 discussion leaders. Um, these are all faculty, but faculty kind of across the school. Uh, getting a uniformity of experience for that process was a challenge, and that was one of the motivations for thinking about other types of formats. So, uh, so I would say our, our curriculum's been running about three years now. I'd say about five or six years ago, um, and it's amazing how I'm hearing echoes of what Peter said in terms of failure, um, we decided to give this a try. Let's try flipping a session. So again, typically what we were doing is lecturing for the students for a couple of hours, and then a the day or so later they'd go and discuss the material in their small groups. And we thought, well, let's flip this around. You know, we're reporting all these lectures. Half the students aren't coming to our lectures. They're watching the videos any, anyway. Surely they'll find this an interesting exercise. Uh, and so what we told them was for two of the sessions in the course, uh, instead of having lectures, we were going to have them watch last year's lecture online, uh, which we made available to them. And we said, you know, do that over the weekend, in tandem. Uh, do that over the weekend and then come in on Monday and instead of lecturing we're going to work through a series of problems together as a group as a large group and so gave this a try came up with what I thought were some really interesting questions that would require them to apply their knowledge in this format and uh, I would say it was met with you know a lot of silence you know, trying to get the students to participate and answer questions 
felt to me like pulling teeth. Uh, so that was the first session. And then the second <coughs> session, uh, I would say about a third of the class didn't even show up. I'm like, what is going on here? And so we then, I don't know if Ed remembers this at all, but we, we basically had to have a class meeting after this and talk about professionalism and the importance of showing up for class. <laughs> and that got into a big debate about, well, you know, I'm a student, I should really decide what approach for learning works best for me, kind of thing. So it was a disaster. I mean, it really was. I'm like, what is this flipped class? Like, this is a mess. <laughs> I mean, I just, and I really didn't know what to make of it, to be honest with you. Um, and so I guess the question is, why did we keep pursuing this approach? Well, other faculty were experimenting with this method in different ways. Uh, we ran a pilot the following year where uh, we took a group of about 40 students sitting much in a tape in a room like this, uh, working through questions in, in that format. That worked much better with a group of 40. But really what I recognize in retrospect was really the key difference was context. That, and I think this is really the message, that if you're going to take chances and do experiments, and if the experiments fail, you have to go back and understand why the experiment failed. And the reason the first experiment failed was that these were students who were used to learning in a particular way. That was actually working pretty well for them. And then we said, whoa, we're just going to change up a couple of these sessions and see if this is a better idea. They can take something that ultimately can work in its own context, but take it out of context and try it this way, it can be a real disaster. And so I don't think it was so much about the content or the format or the flipping or so forth, but really about the larger context. And you know, we now have a curriculum that's almost exclusively flipped sessions uh, for the medical students. And they do all the prep work, they work really hard, they come to the sessions, they're really very engaged and motivated. I think faculty are enjoying this and so I think we're confident that this kind of flipped classroom format can work for medical <laughs> students but that sure isn't the conclusion I would have drawn from our one pilot experiment so I, I just say the lesson that I've learned from this is pilots are critical and important and we learn from them but you also have to really interpret them properly and and this notion of context and you know how do you experiment in a course is a challenge I mean should should course pilots really be Pilots within a course are, are of a whole course, because maybe you can't draw very broad conclusions from doing specific experiments, because the students have a certain set of expectations. So in any case, that was the story that I wanted to share. I think experimentation is good. Um, failure, you can learn from, but I guess keep plowing ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so with that, we're actually going to ask you guys to think about a risk that you haven't taken but want to take within the next year. And Delia will want you to write it down if you're even up for it. Verbalize it with a partner because, you know, the whole thing, if you write it down, you're more willing to do it. If you tell it to someone, you're even more willing to do it. So with that, again, think about a risk that you want to take within the next year and figure out a plan to make that happen. And we want to help you make that happen. So on the little note cards that you have at your tables, just write down resources that you might want to help you take this risk. Um, and in these packets as well, we've compiled a bunch of resources as well. So there's just some Harvard specific sites. The top, Hilt, um, Instructional Moves just came out. It's really cool. And then school specific context, which really is this phenomenal list compiled by Hilt of folks that you can reach out to in the specific schools who can help you take these risks. Anywhere from filming your lectures to see what works, to trying out an activity for you, for giving you kind of mock students to test something on. So all of that is available for you guys. Um, and then if you are more interested in flipping classrooms too, there's a new book that just came out called Flip Learning, a Guide for Higher Education Faculty, where he talks about how he failed with flipping. So if you like this concept of failing at flipping, um, that book in specific tells you a lot more about it. So again, just as the takeaways from today, <laughs> take the risk, get support, and then learn from what most likely will be an initial failure. So if you guys just want to take some time to verbalize, write down, and end on that.